interesting week. But to me, it sort of symbolized what I think the Lord is doing in this season. And I want us to get ready. I believe that there's going to be a time of shaking in this nation. And everything's going to be shaken. The political, the economic, the social, all kind of stuff is going to be shaken. And we got to get rooted and grounded in Jesus in his word and we got to come together as a people we got to show each other love we got to encourage one another and strengthen one another this week elder brian was supposed to minister and uh at 8 45 on saturday morning he sent me a text he had a fever he was very weak and i'm like oh lord that's my speaker, and that's my ride, all in one. And I called Elder Kenyatta, and Elder Kenyatta is in New York. A lot of people are out of town this week. Then you have people who are experienced and have experienced passing and death. And so a lot is going on. And the Lord said to me, you speak. And this is really part two of what I did last Sunday. I had already started working on that message a couple of weeks ago, but I thought I would be doing it three weeks, four weeks from now, you know. And the Lord said, no, you do this this Sunday. So I had a day to pull it together. Then we had an interesting thing happen on Thursday, I believe. Pastor C was walking around. He was supposed to have been using his walker upstairs, and he fell. He fell and he hit his head so hard, he had a, looked like an egg on his head. And he was in pain, we got him up, we got him dressed, we took him to the emergency room. And he wasn't in pain for most of the time, he was okay. But this thing was so big, it started growing was a really big lump and you could see there was blood under the skin so they did for first cat scan then they wanted to do a second cat scan they wanted to make sure that their bleeding was not coming from his brain so they did the second cat scan and they said good news it's just blood on the outside of the brain and praise God praise God glory to God for just nothing but the faithfulness of God we were in the hospital from 11 in the morning till 10.30 at night. And the Lord is just good. He's faithful. He's merciful. And he alone is our help. If you don't know in this season that God alone is your help, you're going to be in trouble. we got to stop looking at everybody else and wanting everybody else to do it. Say, Jesus is your man. Because he's right there for us. So I'm going to pray for a minute, and then I'm going to talk to you about the bride again, the bride and the bridegroom, because the bridegroom is coming. So we got to get ready. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness and your love. We thank you for your mercifulness, how you help us in the time of trouble. You even warn us in advance, letting us know when stuff is coming. And you let us know that if we will abide and dwell in the secret place of the Most High God, if we abide under the shadow of the Almighty, all kind of stuff can happen around us, but it will not come near us. Teach us how to run and find that secret place, not just visit when we have a problem. Teach us how to live there. To abide means to live, to dwell to take up residence in the secret place. We thank you, Father. We honor you. We worship you. And we acknowledge it is only you that is our help in this season. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Give us ears to hear. Give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, last Sunday we talked about the bride and the bridegroom. And we know that Jesus is the bridegroom and the body of Christ, the church, is the bride. And we learned that the most important thing for us to be doing now individually and corporately is to get ourselves ready for the bridegroom. 
Now, I told you last week, whenever you see a bride and she's getting ready for her wedding, she spends all of her focus, her time, her money, everything getting ready for her wedding. We as the body of Christ got to get ready for the bridegroom. Revelations 19, 7. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. The most important event that you can be called to within time and within eternity this is this marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a culmination of the creation of man and the world and of all the pre-planning that God did. So when he was making and creating the world, this was a culmination. It will be a culmination of all of that. It's a culmination of the spiritual battle between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. You know, we've been in a war since man got here. There's been raging the war between light and darkness. Now, there should be a sense of awe and anticipation and even fear that we have. Because if we're not called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're in trouble. We've got to be called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm so glad. I'm grateful for the blood of Jesus. I don't know what to do. I'm so grateful. It's because of his blood we'll be called. Now, we don't want to be like the five foolish virgins that miss the coming of the bridegroom. And what troubles me so much about this story Jesus gave, this parable, is that all of the virgins were looking for and waiting for the bridegroom. There was 10 of them. Five of them were ready. Five of them weren't. So we see in Matthew 25, 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto 10 virgins, which took their lamps, they went forth to meet the bridegroom, and five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, and while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. So the bridegroom is tarrying right now. The reason I know is because Jesus died on the cross more than 2,000 years ago. Now, he told us, I'm coming back. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm coming back to get you. But 2,000 years is a long time. So in our minds, it's a long time. But you got to remember to God, one day is like a 1,000, and a 1,000 years is like a day. So from God's perspective, it's just a moment. In our time, it seems so long. But Matthew 25, 6 says, but at midnight there was a cry made. It says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. I think we're in midnight. There is a cry being made. Now, if you'll notice, a whole lot more people are talking about Jesus is coming. You got folks not even saved saying, Oh, something went on. Something's changed. Something's happening. So we are in the beginning of sorrows based upon the things in the things that God said would be happening, we're in the beginning of sorrows. And everybody's saying Jesus is coming back or the world is ending or something. My husband was watching the Terminator as I was getting dressed to come here. And I thought about it, and I said, really, that story is about man's imagination about how the world would end. And even the scientists nowadays, based upon what they see going on in the planet, they're starting to give timelines about when the planet's going to be dying. They even know stuff is winding up. So if God doesn't intervene, we're going to end up destroying the planet anyway, okay? We're such a mess. We're so self-destructive. We're so greedy. We do stuff that would end up destroying the planet anyway. But fortunately, God's going to step in, and he's going to have his way. But Matthew 25, 7, going on with the story, said, Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage 
and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Mm. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now, oil usually represents the Holy Spirit. And the bride should be making herself ready and preparing her heart. Jude 1.20 tells us what we're supposed to be doing to get ourselves ready as the bride. It says, but beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So this is not a picture of church folk just living all kind of ways and doing whatever they want to do. And I've told you before, now is the wrong time to be going buck wild and just be sinning and partying and doing what you want and thinking, oh, Jesus will forgive me. It'll be all right. This ain't the time for that. This the wrong time. And we have that going on. I'm seeing people just doing whatever they want to do. I'm like, have you all lost the fear of God? What's wrong? The bride is preparing, should be preparing for her new home. So this is not the time to get all invested in the world and act like you don't have to face eternity because we all have to face eternity. So instead of partying and trying to look like the world, sound like the world, and act like the world, we need to be being vigilant and watching and waiting. Now, 1 Peter 5, 8 says to be sober, be vigilant, because guess what? You got an adversary. The devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So now is not the time to be acting foolishly. Nor are we supposed to be paralyzed with fear because we see the end times. So you have some people partying and acting like, you know, ain't nothing going to be no problem. And then you got other folks, oh, my God, the world's just coming to an end. Oh, my God, where are we going to go hide? I'm going to go under a bunk bunker somewhere. Oh, no, no. We're supposed to occupy till he comes. We can't get caught up in fear because, yes, you're going to see a lot of mess. But neither are we supposed to be acting like, oh, no, I don't see it. Everything is fine. Everything going to be fine. I understand there was another earthquake somewhere in California, and they're saying they don't know. They can't find the fault line for earthquake we just had in New York, New Jersey. They don't know why that happened. God's shaking stuff, honey. Hello? Can you hear me now? Keep playing. Can you hear me now? And stuff going to happen. Folk be like, oh, my God. What? Oh, my. So we need to be vigilant and sober. Luke 19, 11 said, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should appear immediately, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered with them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. So that's what we're supposed to be doing. Not shaking in fear, not partying. We're supposed to be occupying. There's things God wants us to do as the bride until he comes. Now, remember, this bride is not just beautiful and clean and righteous. She's a warrior. She's fighting for a kingdom of light. She's working to win those last few souls to Jesus. Understand it. If you know stuff is winding up, we need to be getting them last souls into the kingdom. All together, we are the ground troops for the Lord's army. We got angels who are the air troops. We're the ground troops. We are fighting for what God wants most. He wants most of all is souls. Jesus did all of that stuff, put on a body, come down in the dirt, the filth, let folk kill him, die, go to hell for us, go back to heaven. And he still got the nerve to be praying and make an intercession, ever liveth to make an intercession for us. Did all of that for souls. So Jude one twenty two again tells us what we should be doing. And it says, and some have compassion, 
making a difference. We're supposed to be making a difference in this world. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. You need to be getting motivated about your family. First, start with your family, your people, folk you love. We, I'm like, I ain't got time for my cousins and aunts and nephews and stuff to be got dying and going to hell. I ain't got time for it. We have to get intentional and focused about ministering to our own family. And you got to be led by the Lord. You know, you can't be up in their face at every family picnic. You need Jesus. <laughs> you don't want to get on folks' nerves. You got to do it and be led of the Lord. You got to minister in love. Your heart has to be, you know, having those prayer times. I told you on Mondays we pray for my husband's family. We get his people together and we pray. On Friday, I pray with my family for our family. And on Thursday, we pray with some of the elders for fresh anointing. And, you know, it's just like you need to be praying. You need to be in a bunch of prayer groups. You got folks in your family you know is dying and going to hell. Don't be, well, I tried to tell them they're hard-headed. Hell is for eternity. We I don't think we get this. We ain't getting it. It's not for 5,000 years. It's forever. We need to love people enough to be, if they won't listen, be praying. And I mean, don't stop. My family, Pastor C's family, I get on the phone with them. It was a couple of Mondays where nobody was on the phone but us, and we went on and prayed. Now we have four, five, and six people get on, and my husband's cousin called this week. Now my husband's cousin, he don't call my, you know, maybe once every five years. We don't see him. But he called, he is very sensitive though. Every time something happens to my husband, he'll call, is everything all right? I just felt like I need to call Clarence. I said, boy, you sensitive, you gotta you connect it in the spirit. I said, he was in the hospital, he just had a fall. He said, oh, wow, wow. And I told him, we praying for you every Monday. He said, thank you, thank you, I need it. My husband's other brother down south sent out on Facebook last week that he found a church in North Carolina. Now, homeboy done did everything. <laughs> this is a rough brother. He, we call him Fuzz. Fuzz like this. He rough. Fuzz found a church. I'm like, you know Jesus is coming. You know Jesus is coming, and God is a miracle worker. He's going to church. I'm like, look at God. We've been praying. You keep praying. I don't care if nobody, you keep praying. It's like hitting a brick. You just keep hitting it. It'll crack. You can't just stop and, oh, well, they're going to hell. No. Get mad about it. Pray for them babies. Some of you got grandchildren and children. They just doing whatever they want to do. Honey, aim and target. Like the, that mother in Terminator, you know, she had that shotgun, and she going after that devil trying to kill her son. Like, we got to get that attitude. Mm-mm. So we have to pull some of them out of the fire. Do not be tricked by the subtle lies of the enemy. He wants you to think God doesn't know what he's doing. Oh my, things are falling apart. The world is coming to an end. So then you're all caught up in fear. The devil is a liar. I told you last week, God is different from man. He does not react to us and the enemy. He does not live within the boundaries of time. He plans what he wants with all of its possibilities, then he runs the movie within our time. So he wrote the script before he made the world. The script was already written, how stuff was going to end, what Adam was going to do. He knew what Adam was going to do. He knew what Lucifer was going to do. It wasn't, oh my God, the devil, he's been thrown out of heaven. What will I do? No, he knew exactly what Lou was going to do. God is not a man. He decided he wanted a bride. So he planned, and Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. The plan was already set up before he made the world. He's omniscient because he knows everything. And he doesn't just know. He has the power to do what he wants about what he knows. That's because he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He created Lucifer. He knew when he made the angels and put Lucifer in charge of the worship with all of his beauty that he was going to turn on him. So the war began with the sin of pride by Lucifer. The Lord created him. He made him. He knew what he was doing. 
Let's look at Ezekiel 28, 13. It says, thou has been in Eden. This is talking about Satan. Thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee the day that thou was created. The instruments were actually created in Lucifer. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. Now, it goes on to talk about him. He's a cherub, and he messed stuff up, and God said, okay, you ain't doing that up in here. He kicked him out of heaven. So the bride, let's focus on the bride. What we have to do right now is focus on Jesus. I told you there's going to be a lot going on, and I'm letting you know early. You think stuff is going, oh, it's going to get better, baby. Stuff going to get crazier. The Lord has already let us know things are going to be happening physically with the weather, with the politics, the nation, socially, financially. So he's letting you know ahead of time so you don't have to be shaking in your boots. You can get focused on him. You get rooted and grounded. I had to really focus today as, and this week because everything in my life shook this week. I'm like, oh, this is a little crazy. And the Lord says, stand still. Trust me and don't let it move you. Because I'm like, okay, I'm looking at my husband. He got a, it wasn't even a bump. He got a ridge along this. It changed the shape of his head. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh my. The Lord said, peace. Just be at peace. Stuff happened with our finances. Stuff happened with this insurance company. Well, they're messing with me. It's tax time. My speaker couldn't come. This person got sick. Somebody else had somebody die over there. It was just like. Oh, okay. The Holy Spirit said, focus, focus. Don't be blown. So I wasn't even feeling myself because I was felt a little sickly. I was, my throat was a little scratchy. And the Lord just said, you just pray, take you some vitamin C and stand on the word. And I'm like, all right, I'll be all right. So we are going to begin to see all kinds of things shaken. So we got to put our roots down deeper. This little shallow baby Christian stuff that we do in this country, I'm sorry. I've been to Africa. I've been to South Korea. I've been to a lot of the islands. Our little version of Christianity is a little pitiful because we spoiled over here. We got so much stuff. We just so blessed. Oh, I'm blessed. That's all we want to think about. You got folks in other nations that's going through for the name of Christ. They are not playing. We can't even get somewhere on time. We like, okay, oh, I'll get there. Baby, come on. If you're going to do something for some money, they said they're going to give you a little bit. They're not even giving you a lot of money on your job. They're giving you a little bit, but we'll come in line for that. Give God your best. Act like he's the most important person in your life. Everything he wants from you, say yes. I've told you before, I don't want to be doing 80% of what I'm doing right now, I don't want to do. I don't feel comfortable. I don't like it. I told you I ain't want to pastor. I ain't want to preach. I ain't want to do nothing. And Jesus said, Ann, really? You said all to Jesus, I surrender. I heard you sing the song. Did you mean it or what? Were you playing or what? So he will definitely call you. He is looking for folks who are going to give them his all. Give us their, his all. Whatever. You know what I mean. But anyway. So... We begin to see, like in Luke 6, 48, Jesus gave another parable. It says, he is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation, built on a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. This is difference between people who hear the word and obey it 
and people who hear the word and don't obey it. There's going to be lots of people who've been in church all their life, heard the word like, yeah, yeah, hi, God bless you, whatever, and they don't do it. So when things start to shake and the storms come up, they're going to be all over the place. Who is doing the shaking? Now, the enemy thinks he's doing the shaking, but he's wrong. The Lord is doing the shaking. Hebrews 12, 26 tells us, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaking, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So the Lord shakes stuff, so the stuff that's rooted, that's the good stuff, will remain. It's like a cleaning. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have peace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, we have a problem. A lot of people have a problem with the, the tough side of God. We like, ooh, love, love. We like that side. But he got that other side that you not, shouldn't be playing with. He's also a consuming fire. But if you're doing what he tells you to do and thank God for the blood and in his presence, you're protected. So the bride has to keep her affections and love for the Lord. She's not sleeping around with the love of money, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. She is not worshiping other gods. The main characteristic of this bride is love. She's exhibiting the fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, temperance, goodness, meekness, those are the fruits that we're supposed to be trying to bring forth and develop in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit are the things that we need to be preparing our hearts with. Being filled with God's Spirit is going to make us beautiful to Him. The greatest is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, you know it. And now abide in faith, hope, charity, these three but the greatest of these is charity or love. Now, you preparing a bride, you want her to be loving. That's the most important thing. Now, I'm not understanding all these prophets nowadays trying to get everybody straight and speaking with all this anger and hatred. That don't go together. You got people who pick up righteous causes, but they have left love behind, but that's not how God flows. Now, yes, we know abortion is wrong, but are we supposed to pick up guns and kill a doctor who performs an abortion? It don't work like that. Something wrong with that. Are those who claim to be conservative Christians supposed to pick up the weapons of darkness to fight against the kingdom of darkness? No. Now, the one thing about heaven, you got to understand, heaven don't take sides. Heaven is not Republican, Democratic, conservative, is not black, is not white. God is God, honey. He's so far above this stuff. It's like, y'all stop playing. I'm, I'm not interested. That's child stuff. God is God. Joshua 5.13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and he looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him, and his sword was drawn in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and said unto him, Are thou for us, or are you for our adversaries? And he said, No. As captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose the shoes off of thy feet. For the place whereof you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. God is not invested and concerned about our little political and our little dumb stuff. He is a spirit. He loves all people. And he wants us to be holy. So the best thing is we got to make sure we're on his side. That's the side you need to be concerned about. He decides everything. No one per nobody on this planet has heaven or hell to put you in? Nobody. He's the one we have to answer to. So we can be spouting scripture and have a heart full of wickedness. And it's not going to do us no good. The Lord is looking at our hearts. 
He sees the self-righteousness, the manipulation, the lust, the greed, the racism, the fear, the unforgiveness. He sees all that. That's what disturbs him. So as part of the bride, we're supposed to be without spot and wrinkle. Now, we know that we all got spots and wrinkles. I don't know about you. I got spots and wrinkles. And I'm like, Jesus, fix me. So the only way you get to where you're supposed to be spiritually is to stop judging everybody else and say, Lord, fix me. It's not about my brother or my sister. Fix me, oh God. Spend your time focusing on telling, asking the Lord to fix you. It's me standing in the need of prayer. He will use you to speak his word, and you should stand for righteousness. But I guarantee he wants it done in love. He wants it done in meekness and in humility. We must remember it's not our job to separate the wheat and the tares in the last days. So you know in the church the word says that there's wheat and tares. There's some folk that are the real deal. Some folk look like they're the real deal, but they're not. Jesus tells us in Matthew 13, 38, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all the things that offend and them which do iniquity. The angels, when God says, They'll gather up the tares and throw them in the fire. They shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So the fact is, the Lord uses all the fighting between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light as a proving ground for us. It's a training ground for us because he wants us to come out as pure gold. All the stuff that you're going through helps build spiritual muscles. Your reaction to your troubles and your trials and your problems, and you do stuff the way God says, it don't mean you're not going to cry. Yes, you're going to cry. You're going to be depressed sometime. You're going to be like, Jesus, help me. But I'm hanging on to you. I'm trust. I'm hanging on to your word. Sometimes when you can't even keep walking, he picks you up and he carries you. Come on, baby. I see you trying. I know it's your heart. Even when you mess up, that's what the blood is for. Father, forgive me. I blew it. Don't say, oh, I'm done. Mm -mm, the blood is wonderful. Confess. He's faithful and just to forgive you. Now, the bride has to be shaking the filth of the world off of her. We got to have a new mindset. We have to beautify ourselves with meekness and a humble heart. She is strong against the enemy because the enemy is against the, her bridegroom. She does all she can to ensure the groom's glory and honor. She endeavors to keep the unity. This is why keeping the unity of the faith is so important. Us learning to work together as a body of Christ. He doesn't want a body that's punching itself in the face. I don't like you. I'm mad at you. I hate you. That's stupid. The body has to work together. So we have to operate in love. The bride does not engage in activities that hurts herself because that defeats the purpose. All of her parts are learning to flow together and love each other. Folk who are really flowing in Jesus are learning to love people more and more because they have a revelation that our love covers a multitude of sin. People in the body of Christ should be important to you. You pray for them because you want them healed and blessed. Even the ones that get on your last nerves, that were mean to you and whatever, baby, suck it up. And I'm like, I am assuming you're part of the body of Christ. I'm going to love you anyhow. We're going to endeavor to keep the faith. And even if you don't respond properly to me, it's okay. I'm going to love you anyway. You don't laugh at folk being hurt. Yeah, they say they got this. Uh-huh. They wasn't right. Uh-huh. No, no. They're part of the body of Christ. When they hurt, you hurt. It's going to hurt you. So we have to love one another. So what is the bride called to do? She's the body. 
She's the hands and the feet of Jesus. She is the functioning and the movement of Jesus on the earth. If the enemy can attack his helper, he thinks he can stop the mission. Jesus has a mission to save mankind. He did his part. Our job is to fight along with him, but we have to let him take the lead. And this is where we mess up sometimes. Oh, we get excited. Yes, God, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. And he's like, no, no, go sit down. I'm the king. I'm the head. You the body. Let me lead you and show you what to do. Now, this is where I go to natural wives, because it's hard for wives, women who are wives, because we have imperfect husbands. But Jesus is the perfect husband. Joe may not do, know what he's doing, but Jesus definitely knows what he's doing. As the helpmeet, we are called to co-labor. And I'm talking about the bride because the, the correlation is between the bride of Christ and a natural bride. As the helpmeet, we are called to co-labor with Jesus as he completes the call of God. And each of us is gifted and assigned to do something in the body. So Satan attacked Eve first. And Adam was so in love with her, he decided, I'm going to obey her instead of God. First Adam did it wrong, but the last Adam did it right. He was so in love with his bride that he gave up for her, he sacrificed, and he died so she could be brought to salvation. The enemy attacked Eve to make her feel like she was missing something. Oh, is that what God said? Oh. But then she used her influence to throw Adam off track. But Jesus did stuff right. First, Adam did not. But just like Eve was taken out of the side of Adam, I believe the body of Christ was taken out of the side of the last Adam. When Jesus was on that cross and they speared him in his side and that blood rushed, I believe that the, the body of Christ was being birthed. See, remember, the Lord is the one that's comparing husbands and wives, bride and bridegroom. He's the one making the comparison. So if he laid Adam down, he opened him side and took out a part and made Eve and the two of them become one through marriage. Then Jesus, on the cross, that side was opened and his bride was birthed. And he said, we are bone of his bone. So in the kingdom of God, the interesting thing, though, the path to power in the kingdom of God is submission. Ooh, a word that no wife wants to hear. Like, no, 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 Don't nobody want to hear that? Mm-hmm. The path to power is submission. But that's not even just for wives. That's for everybody in the body of Christ. He says, submitting yourselves one to another. So the Lord gives us natural wives. Our path to power is submission. Now, let's look at 1 Peter 2, 19 through 25. And he makes the correlation. It says, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you as an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. Now, usually we stop right there because it's another chapter, but it continues. In the same way, wives, see it goes from chapter 2 to chapter 3. In the same way, wives, you submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words, by the behavior of their wives. 
when they see the purity and the reverence of your wives, your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adorning, such as elaborate hairstyles, wearing of gold and fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of the inner spirit, the inner self, the unfaded beauty of a quiet and meek and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Now, I don't think this means that women can't have nice hairstyles and nice jewelry. It's saying, focus on the inner beauty. The inner beauty is a meek and quiet spirit. And I've taught this to the wives many times. Meek and quiet spirit doesn't mean meek and quiet personality. You can have a woman who's very meek. Yes, dear, but on the inside, I want to kill you. <laughs> so, you know, meek and quiet personality is different from your spirit. Uh, you can have a person who's very outgoing and a strong woman, but she will submit herself. So that's what's beautiful to God, that meek and quiet spirit. It says in verse 5, For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. Now that's the key for the wives that are natural wives. You got to put your hope in God especially when you're dealing with a natural Adam, a natural man who got all kind of problems and mess and issues. It's like, Lord, I'm trusting you. My hope is not in him. My hope is in you. I'm doing things as unto the Lord. I'm being obedient as unto you, and you will make it right. So in the same way, this is all part of promotion in the kingdom of God. As we humble ourselves it is Jesus' plan to give us power. Now, this is for everybody in the body of Christ. See, don't take it on upon yourself like Eve. Satan's thing for Eve was, uh, uh, you you missing out on something. Why don't you go ahead and take the fruit? You're not going to die. So she thought she was missing out on something, so she messed up. But all of us in the body of Christ, the rule for promotion in the kingdom of God is opposite from the world. The world, the way up in the kingdom of God is down. You humble yourself, he will exalt you in due season. See, in the world, it's like you push yourself, pass out your cards, rub shoulders, you make yourself, you declare yourself. In the kingdom of God, it says you humble yourself, I will exalt you in due season. That's the promotion thing. So God is the one who gives promotion. It doesn't come from the east to the west, north, to south. it comes from God. One reason is because our king knows that ev he knows everything. He's smarter and more powerful than anybody else. So if you don't know that about God, that he's smarter and knows more than you, you stupid. That's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You got to at least know God knows more than me. I may not like it. I may not agree. Doesn't matter. He knows more. Secondly, he tells us to do this is because we're in the middle of the war and insubordination could cost you your life and the life of others. Now, we're soldiers in a war. We're in a fight. You got a kingdom of darkness trying to destroy us. When the Lord says, move, you move. You don't be, well, God, you know, I don't even see the point. And blah. No, no, you duck. God sees the bullet. He knows it's coming. You're not insubordinate. You do what the Lord tells you to do. 1 Peter 5, 6, I'm almost done. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober. Why? Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Then he tells you how to use the sufferings of this world that you're going through so that you don't have to sin. The Lord uses what we go through to help us to grow. First Peter 5.10, But the grace, God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, he will make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So there's a purpose. There's a reason that God allows his bride to go through suffering. 
He's pruning her. He's getting her ready. He's getting her cleaned up. He wants to see the fruit of the spirit in her. He wants her to learn how to fight alongside him to save souls. Suffering is that path to power. 1 Peter 2.21, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. So that's the key. You commit yourself to the Lord. He is the judge. The first Adam blamed his wife, but the last Adam protected, saved, and delivered her. Adam and Eve, Eve blamed the devil, but the Lord he helped us. He delivered us. And the most important thing right now is to be falling in love with Jesus. Obeying him, falling in love with him. Don't just have a casual relationship. Get to know him. Let's stand. We're done. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I ever did. Child, child. Thank you, Lord. I was talking to my sister the other day, a sister in the Lord, and we were talking about how even though we have good husbands, there's only so much they can do, only so much they can love us. There is a place in every man, woman, and child down deep inside of you that nobody can touch but Jesus. There's an empty place made for God inside of you. And once you get that straightened up, you can go through a whole bunch of stuff because he is your foundation. He is your rock. He is your stability. He stabilizes you. But if you're running around looking for a man and looking for a woman and got to feel I got to have children and I got to have a big job and I got to have a house and got to be impressive to people. When you finish, you're going to still be empty. Just look at Hollywood. Them folk ain't happy. They're still empty falling in love with Jesus. We are the bride. You need to be learning how to love him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Falling in love. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling Disconnected, never disconnected. Oh, it is all I feel, I feel protected. It was the best thing I've ever done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We exalt you, oh God. We thank you, Lord. Could not make it without you, Lord. You are our reason for hope, our reason for life. You are our strength, our help, our healing, our deliverance. People will let us down every time. Mother, father, sister, brother, husband, children will always let us down because they're flesh. They're human. They hurt. They got their own issues. They can't carry us. Only you can carry us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Teach us how to fall in love with you, Lord. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love, falling in love with Jesus. Oh, falling in love with Jesus. It was a
the best thing, the best thing I've ever done. It was the best thing, it was the best thing I've ever, ever done. It was the best thing I've ever, ever done. Lord Jesus, we honor you. Enough sense that nobody can love me like you can love me. When I feel like I'm all alone, you're the one there for me, God. I thank you for your mercies and your grace. You're the only one that understands me. I don't even understand myself. You understand me. You know me. You know the number of hairs on my head. You loved me while I was yet in the filth of sin. You hugged me and held me. Your blood covered me. I'm so grateful. Help us, oh God, to be prepared, to prepare ourselves. We're part of the bride. Cleanse us. Help us to keep growing. Help us to keep learning. We never get to the place where we know it all. We know in part. Correct us when we're wrong. Remove the blinders when the enemy is deceiving us. We're so grateful for the blood. We take authority over every plot and scheme of the enemy, every lie of the devil. And Father, we thank you have given us power over all the works of the enemy. You gave your bride power. You want us to operate in power in your authority as we are directed and led and instructed by you. We don't go out as rebels and do what we want. We say, yes, Lord, yes, my, my master. What is it you would have me to do? And we might say, Lord, it's hard, it hurts, but we remember you suffered for us first. You paid the price. So you said we're called unto that. We're called to suffer. Church, don't, people don't want to hear that now, but we're called to suffer. Because the way to power is suffering. You want to promote those. As we humble ourselves, you will exalt us in due season. And then, Father, we pray if there's anybody here or anybody watching that's not saved. If you're here or if you're watching and you're not saved, it's so easy to get saved. He made it so simple. Just pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. You died to save me. I am a sinner. I need salvation. I believe you were died and went into that grave and you were resurrected. You took my place. Please save me. Please save me. I thank you for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bride, get up every day and ask God to cleanse you. Start getting ready for the wedding. Hallelujah. He's made mansions for us. He's went back to prepare a place for us. It's awesome. It's awesome. Pastor Michael Robinson's mother just passed away on Thursday and he said on Wednesday my mama called me to her room and she said I see my mama she said she's in a place it's beautiful and she was so excited she said son I'm going to glory it's such a blessing to know this is not the end we have a place that we're going we're going to glory and the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. We won't even be able to compare it. So we thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We're going to do our benediction saying, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when your spirit with my whole heart 
dismissed. Have a great week. We love you. God bless you. Thank you, God.